in the middle of the jungle, they're trying to find natural gas by blowing up little explosions and hearing the echoes in the ground. Also, Alaska, 300 miles south of the North Pole, we were drilling for oil at that time. It was ridiculously difficult. And that was the point. Oh, and also Iran. On the Iraqi border, at 10,000 feet and more, these sand mountains. So oil was coming from hard places. Public didn't know it. A guy at Mobile Oil, who's kind of a writer, gets an idea. He's going to tell the true story of oil men. And he gets the job, goes to Paris with an advertising agency, Young and Rubicam, hires people who look like oil men, flies them to Algeria, and they act like oil men on the drilling rig because they look right. He says to himself, this is disgusting. Nothing to do with oil men. Oil men are rough. Texas boys, really a certain breed of people, men, on those rigs. I don't like this. Let's hire a documentary guy. And the documentary guy, very fortunate for my life, I'll tell you about that, is me. The end result was this movie, 10 minutes, ran in hundreds of movie theaters around the country, was very popular, nominated for an Academy Award about the oil people, very strange, and a real documentary. So take a look, and then I'll tell you what happened to me and what happened to these guys in these special places. Well, we're a little bit north of the North Sea. That's where we are. About 61 degrees, 20 minutes north. And we're trying to drill an oil well. The first time on an oil rig, I was lonely, I was cold. A hundred men, a lot of machines, like they were looking for gold. Worked that hole for 80 straight days Till the stuff came up like a flood I don't know when, I don't know how But a little drop got in my blood I live out here like a pioneer Away from the easy places I got no friends but the oil rig And these familiar faces No women, no wine working all the time but it's satisfying to me and if there's oil beneath my feet this is where i want to be we parked this uh big monster here and we set out eight anchors and we expect it to hold in waves that are 75 feet high winds that are over 120 miles an hour weather we've never faced before never had to think about facing before whether the ships go around uh, we're flying in the west of Iran, up near the Iraqi border, uh, in support of the mobile Impico uh, drilling operations here. When you're hauling loads, like we haul here, which run 50, 60 tons, you're running over roads that don't have any bottom at all. Uh, you have some real interesting things. You're even kind of scared to drive a passenger car over them, much less uh, a heavy truck with maybe 30 or 40 tons loaded on it. I'd much rather be down in the valley myself, but it seemed like most of our locations are right on top of a darn mountain. In all kinds of weather, it's too cold, too hot, or too wet. I'm tired at times and hungry too, but I ain't never quit yet. I miss my family and my hometown And I go there now and then Pretty soon I get restless I can't wait to get back again We're roughly 300 miles from the North Pole We're 100 or so miles from uh, Point Barrow To the east of Point Barrow It is the last frontier, I guess, of the United States An awful cold one I work 12 hours, I'm off 12 hours, I hear the sound even when I'm sleeping. The bit keeps turning, going down and down like a giant heart keeps on beating. When you drill for days and you finally hit oil, that's what it's all about. Most times we don't find nothing, so we gotta move further out. People think you can just go out here and drill an oil well anywhere, but you gotta you got about uh, 
more than half of them dry hole. Well, we're on a seismic line which is going straight from the north of Sumatra, Achi country, for about 20 miles due east. And the first people that come along have to cut a line with a compass. They get a compass bearing and just go straight ahead with their parangs, knives, and cut through the jungle. We've got to go in a straight line because we're doing sort of echo sounding. We make big explosions and listen for the echoes. OK, send him tone. Send tone. I'm from London, England. It's about seven, 8,000 miles away. I didn't really count too far because I shan't be back there for two years. Um, sounds a long time, but we work for 20 days out here, non-stop, seven days a week, 10, 12 hours a day, as long as the light lasts. And then we go into Singapore or somewhere in Southeast Asia for rest and recuperation. And you need it after that time. It's real difficult on the family life. Just, for instance, living here in Shawmod, uh, there's only one other English-speaking family here, which makes the two of us. And uh, you're either friends or you can forget it, right? Right. We kind of think of it as a job most of the time, but every once in a while, we start really thinking why we're out here. It's a lot of it's for the money. A lot of it's for the excitement, a lot of it's for the challenge. But then again, a lot of it's for your kids, too. Once you go into it, it gets in your blood. I know of nobody that went into the oil business and stayed two years that has ever left it. It's still an art. It's fun. I, I know that there's a lot better jobs, but I wouldn't change with anybody. Live out here like a pioneer, away from the easy places. I got no friends but the oil rig and these familiar faces. No women, no wine, working all the time, but it's satisfying to me. If there's oil beneath my feet, this is where I want to be. Well, to find oil is, uh, is a real thrill. Once you have drilled a well, you, you cord it and test it, put it through the tester, and, and when, when it's all over, you look back, and you forget all of these problems that you've had, all the cold nights, all the anxieties, all the problems that you've had. Well, we've made a well. I live out here like a pioneer, away from the easy places. Got no friends but the oil rig and these familiar faces. No women, no wine, working all the time, but it's satisfying to me. If there's oil beneath my feet, this is where I want to be. Okay, so here's a story about each of these places. The North Sea. I'm going to tell you two stories about the North Sea. One, just days before I got there, an oil man was blown off the rig and they died. The boat goes around the rig 24 hours a day trying to protect the rig and the people on it because the wind was so strong and the thing's going up and down like this. I mean, up to 70 feet. It was very hard to shoot and it was really scary and this guy blows off. So I'm very nervous. I hadn't been places like this, guaranteed. I'd never been places like North Norway and then flying off a helicopter and I'm in a helicopter with my four guys with me, my crew, and I don't know, 30 boxes of equipment that we took. And the helicopter is through the fog and it all of a sudden stops. And I'm sitting in the back seat and I look at the two pilots who are Norwegian and they're white. And they're not just looking at each other and their skin, they turn white. 
knock on the guy's shoulder. Hey, uh, any problem? Um, we, there's a 747 in the area and we don't know where it is. Holy shit. We're stuck like this. All of a sudden they go through the fog, come down, and the, the rig is going like this. And they take the helicopter, run on top of the landing pad, and they go, drop the thing, crash, door opens. Well, my says, welcome home, buddy. And they helped me carry the 30 boxes out. It was unbelievable to be on that rig. You felt like we're a billion miles from home. I survived, obviously, and I made that movie. Now let's look at Sumatra. In Sumatra, uh, several weeks before I got there, an oil man had his head hacked off by a Muslim extremist. These were really tribal people living out in the middle of nowhere. And I was, again, scared shitless. The helicopter flew along the river and it just dropped into the river. And when I got out, there was like 5,000 Achenese, Banda Achi, on the, sh that's the city, on the shore just looking. So one guy comes over with a spear and he attaches himself to my partner and he looks very threatening and we can't talk to him and he can't talk to us. And the oil guys keep saying, go away, go away. And he doesn't go away. And um, so I think, what am I going to do here? I want to survive. So I said, hey, um, sandwich, can you buy us a sandwich? And somebody translates, yes. So we give him some money and off he goes. So he's gone. We could shoot this scene where, by the way, I walked in the river. You see a scene of us walking through the river and uh, my feet skin peeled for a year when I got home from whatever was in that river, but it didn't kill me. But that was plenty scary. He comes back about three and a half hours later and he's got a sandwich, two pieces of bread and a fish, the whole fish with the eyes and the head sort of cooked in the sandwich. And he's looking like this, he's happy. He did us a really good turn and I really appreciated it. And I ate the sandwich. It was not easy to eat that sandwich, but you know what? That guy was his, it was his nation and he was being nice to me. We didn't make that film. I got the runs. I got bitten a whole hell of a lot of times by mosquitoes. There were tigers in the area. But today, that natural gas feeds Japan. Japan wouldn't have energy without the natural gas coming out of Sumatra that they discovered in that oil field. And a whole culture of Sumatra people make their living and made their living and up their scale of living because of that find, the great gas field in northern Sumatra. Okay, in Iran, Kermanshaw, the border between Iraq and Iran where I saw the Kurds, thousands of Kurds were walking with these beautiful clothing. Uh, they are not Iranian, they are not Persian. And they just were traveling between Iraq and Iran. That was quite amazing. And I'm there with one other guy, and it's really in this strange hotel in town where the bathroom was a hose and a hole, and no one spoke English at all. And we're in the ho this little hotel. And I said, I want to look at the market. And I was with another guy, one of my guys. He was tall, waspy looking guy with white hair, very Anglo. People thought I was Iranian, so nobody really hassled me much. And we went to what was called the Shuk, a huge Shuk in Kermanshaw, beautiful. And we're looking through the Shuk and we're seeing beautiful rugs and gold jewelry that was not expensive. And I thought beautiful little pieces of art, carved ivory. And people are running by us and they're pointing to my friend and they're saying something that I didn't know what it was. So I asked one of the shopkeepers who spoke English, what are they saying to us? I, it sort of was unfriendly, but I wasn't sure. And they were screaming non-believer. Well, six months later, the Iran revolution occurred. We were six months before that revolution, which totally changed that society. And we have what we have today. Iran was an amazing place. I really liked the people. Uh, very nice and very enterprising and in intelligent. But being up on those mountains, those sand mountains with the Kurds passing by was something I will never forget. Alaska. If you ever thought of eating sugar all the time, think of Alaska, northern Alaska, cold midwinter, two hours of light. We had two hours of light to film, otherwise it was dark, and you ate constant donuts, coffee, donuts, coffee, all kinds of sugar to stay warm. Well, two things that really are memorable to me. One, I'm out there trying to shoot and the camera freezes immediately. Hmm. And we had special cold weather cameras. So I went in this room, I wrapped the camera cable around the battery, around my arm, I held the camera, I turned it on, and I went outside. And for about three or four minutes it ran, but my hand froze solidly so that the wire was solid and couldn't move it. And I just rolled and rolled and rolled till that ran out, then I ran back in, changed the magazine, 
cleaned the lens, and went outside again. That's how cold it was. And in that cold, I got into trouble at one point. I was filming an oil guy who was walking, and the, something went wrong with the camera, and I needed a screwdriver. And I'm not taking my glove and second glove off. We were wearing oil boots, super high masks. If you've ever been in 60 below zero, and you breathe, and your breath stops, that's a really frightening feeling. And this guy, this oil man, he takes off his glove, and he takes off his inner glove, and he grabs a screwdriver, and he says, and meanwhile, his, his hand is freezing. It was just an act of kindness. I was treated that way. For example, in the North Sea, I didn't know that the chain that pulls the pipe pulls really taut, and if you're there, it could kick you in a really bad way and probably kill you. And I was in the way of the chain shooting, just excited to be with these oil guys, and the thrill of drilling, which is just incredibly exciting when you're exploratory drilling like that, little rigs. And a guy kicks me across the room. And I turn around like that, not knowing why he kicked me, and he says, points to the chain, because you couldn't talk too much noise. And I went, he saved my life. That happened to me several times on these shoots. So I'd like to tell you what I got out of this, but I first want to tell you what America got out of this. First of all, America got fuel-efficient cars. That's where fuel efficiency started. Second of all, America got shale which is our currently our supplies most of our oil. Shale oil and the investigation of shale oil began at that time. We also got, of course, smaller cars. You may not like that, but that's what happened because we were so worried after the oil crisis, could this happen to us again? And then, of course, there's alternative energy. That's really what provoked the whole effort towards solar and wind and everything else. People said, we got to have another way. It wasn't really the environmental movement that propelled this. It was the oil crisis of 1973 and 74. Now myself, well, I learned how to travel. I really learned how to travel. I was very afraid of travel. I was the kind of guy who didn't go places that were hard because it was scary. And I grew up on Long Island that had never been anywhere. And this taught me that you could survive, that there were friendly people everywhere. And it also taught me that oil people are wonderful folk. I loved the oil industry. If I was a different kind of guy, I would have been an oil man. So exciting when they hit, when they found oil, that thrill was just beautiful. If you're in trouble in a third world country, don't go to the United States Embassy first. Don't go to the lawyer first, go to the oil company. They know everything. They know how to get in and out. They know what's needed. They know who to trust. So I would always call on an oil guy in the middle of nowhere if I was stuck and in trouble. Hope you enjoyed me and this. Let me know if you did become a subscriber, and please support me on Patreon. Do I like asking for money? No, I do not like asking for money. I'd like to be rich, but I'm not. I make a living this way, or a part of my living, and I'd like to make it my living to make YouTube videos for folks like you who hopefully enjoy me, and you enjoy the movies that I made and me showing them, giving you perspective. In any case, thank you for watching.